That's a great question. Depends on the situation and what you're saving yourself from. What can you save yourself from? Drowning. Drowning. Okay. How do you do that? Don't panic. Don't panic. Ski. <laughs> Swim. That's fair. Those are great answers. Glad you can do that. What else can you save yourself from? Financial ruin. Okay. How do you do that? I'm making a budget and sticking to it. Making a budget and sticking to it. And nothing ever happens that derails that budget. Oh, I can't say that. Okay. So you're confident in your budget, you're okay. <laughs> some of us have the capacity to account for some margin. Just make more money and everything's fine. When margin is not there, that can be difficult. That's why they have bank loans. <laughs> yes. There's these lovely places of all of which I'd... If we, could, if we could get away with this as far as, well, this, this is our religious liberty to be able to do this, I'd burn them all down. I'd burn down every cash max or whatever it is that's out there. Burn them all. Yeah. How community hasn't stepped up per se, or maybe there isn't a community for those people that your hot water heater explodes and you need a new one, and that sends you into ruin because you don't have community that can help you. Yeah. And that's really sad. And there's a variety of different things that go into this, right? There's loads and loads of, of, of opportunities that exist both to help and that would hurt or create that situation where, okay, I'm, I'm sunk. My budget has been exceeded. And we, we've, been, we've been part of working with someone that's dealt with a lone shark. And they're sharks. They're little thieves. I don't want to give them that much credit. What else can you save yourself from? You can save money a little at a time, like saving for emergencies, expenses. Yeah. The, there are ways of which, and that, that's, that's, I think, where community does its best work, is when we help each other be ready for things like that, not help them on the backside of that. But oftentimes, it's the same deal as, you know, giving a hungry guy a fish so that he can then learn how to fish. It's often a both hand that the community needs to jump in and do. But there's loads and loads and loads of situations that happen in life, yes? How many of them can we truly save ourselves from? All of the things that we have even said that we can save ourselves from these situations, that is, that's a facade of control. When it comes down to it, we feel as though we have control, and I'm, I'm not here to unsettle you this much by intention, but we often, we often have this idea that we are in control of our lives, and that in most cases we can do something about our situation. Now hopefully, by God's grace, he has gifted you to deal with the life that he's called you to live, and he's providing through that. But may we never forget then it's not us doing the work or doing the providing. Because I, I believe that there are times when God simply says, oh, you think you're doing this? Well, here, let's see how well you do. And we have the opportunity to grow in our humility. Or humiliation, however that works. I suppose that's the act of being, becoming humble. But there are many times when we have this idea that we are in control, that we have, we have life by the horns and can do what, what we need to do, can make things work. And that really is just not the case. Well, my testimony is that my life has, and the experiences I've had have made it very clear to me that I can't save myself from anything. Ah and that my only anchor 
what I've ever really had that is gone. Everything else has popped out of the, the rocks at some point in time. So I have learned that um, the smartest thing for me is to go straight to God and get his input and then move right beyond all of that mishmash and <laughs> yeah. all of that time wasted trying to f do it myself in my way because it never works. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. great wisdom right there. When you reach my age, you just give up and say, okay, God, how are we going to do this? <laughs> what do you want to do now? Yeah. How, how do you want to pull this one off? Because I, I, I don't know. I don't yeah. know how to do this. So let's look at Galatians 3. Galatians 3, picking up at verse 23. I am going to be mean today and not read the first two chapters of Galatians. Okay? So if you need the background, please go back and read it. Galatians 3, picking up at verse 23. Before this faith came, we were held prisoners by the law, locked up until faith should be revealed. So the law was put in charge of us to lead us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. Now the faith has come, we are no longer under the supervision of the law. You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Whose are we? Yeah. We belong to Christ. We are his body. Where does that leave us? If you try to separate yourself from that, where does that leave you? Stuck? Stuck? Okay. Head. Headless? It's true. That works well for chickens, I hear. <laughs> it doesn't work well, does it? When we try to live outside of the body, it doesn't work well. And ironically, to live outside the body is to live for ourselves. It really seems weird, but that's, that's the situation. When we become selfish instead of selfless, we become isolated. Now, Many of the things that we mentioned before on how we save ourselves from situations, that's called insulation, right? We effectively insulate from the bad things that happen. Insurance is a big one. How many of us have some form of insurance in life? It's, it's so prevalent that it's required by law on many, many situations. You have to have it. That's right. If you can provide uh, financial security in order to, yeah. Yeah, that's exciting. That's exciting. But as we insulate ourselves from catastrophe, from situations that we want to save ourselves from, as we begin to insulate ourselves from those things, what do you suppose happens in our lives? What's that? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Th think about a coat for just a second. Okay, what does a coat do? This coat does nothing to provide warmth. It really doesn't. There's no heater in here. There's no heater. Now, it does provide some way of shedding water. That's a good thing, right? But in and of itself, it does not provide heat. What does it do? It keeps your body heat. Right? Just like insurance. But, well, maybe. This one, yes. There are coats that I've seen people wear that I'm like, I think I need insurance to own the coat. 
This is insane. <laughs> but we reach that point, don't we? I mean, think about it. When you start thinking about a homeowner's policy covering the contents of your home, and yet there are times when we're like, maybe, maybe that's not enough. Or when we start thinking about life insurance. Those are always fun conversations to have, aren't they? This, this brings us though to a, a, a situation where we can insulate ourselves so well that we isolate ourselves from the world. We isolate ourselves out of community, out of the body of Christ, and we are not able to receive the help we need. If you're outside in the cold for a long, long time and you end up getting super cold or hypothermic, and you get brought into the warmth, what do you suppose the best thing to do is? Warm up slowly. Warm up slowly, that is true. You actually want to uncover out of the stuff that you've been insulating yourself with so that you can receive the warmth from around you. Because if you continue to isolate, you won't be able to warm up. It seems kind of crazy, doesn't it? We are part of this family. As we look at this passage again, th this, this law, what, what is the law? Can you go with the Ten That's part of it, yes. There's a whole load of things that go along with the Ten Commandments of which the law helps to show sin. That's what it does. That's the, that's the job of the law. It's to lead us to Christ. Now, how can something that shows sin lead us to Christ? Scares the bejeebus out of you. Well, that's, that can be true. It scares the bejeebus kind of, yeah? Well, I mean, Old Testament was. I, I think Old Testament was much more of, if you do this, then you're going to be stoned. Well, you know, <laughs> we don't see the need for a Savior. We're not going to go looking for one. He, yeah. And that goes over to, if you can afford a catastrophic failure in your life, then you don't have to have insurance. <laughs> and if it seems we can afford life without Christ, then why would we bother to get to know this guy? Yeah, well, that seems kind of weird. This, the law helps to reveal, though, the different things in our lives, the 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 way that we interact with the world and how that works that has separated us from God. That's what the law does. And in doing so, it reveals the need that we have for Christ. And in coming to Christ and submitting to him, we get to be part of this family. And the only way this works well is if we lose ourselves, if we shed all the insulation stuff that we had on ourselves so that we can be part of the family of God. But we can't keep the stuff that's isolating us from his community. When we do so, it's the equivalent of stepping out of even what your own family is. How do you do that? Yeah. If we do everything the world tells us to do to take care of ourselves, we will be so busy working so hard to pay for all of that. Sure. The world has fairly high standards, believe it or not. And where do those standards end? They don't. They don't. And I'm convinced that's intentional. We do not change the world running on a hamster wheel. And so long as the hamster wheel is still running, and we're still on it, then we're not working as the family of God, as his agents of reconciliation. I'm absolutely convinced of that. When we're too consumed with our own lives and making the, the things that the world says we need to have, when we're too busy doing this, yeah. we're not doing the work that we're called to do. Amen. I don't know where the microphone is. It's lost. So that was kind of proven to me in a very physical way last summer. 
and I'll try and keep this short. I had done a lot of riding down in, in Lima, and there was a horse that was pretty hot. It was an old show jumper that he could jump anything that was there on the, on the property and take off if he so wanted. And wow. here I was sitting on him going, oh, God, he could jump out of here, and where am I going to be? So at any rate, my trainer and my friend, she's like, sit back and breathe. Hmm. Because when I tried to be in control, guess what? You weren't. He danced all over the place. He was ready to go. Yeah. Lean forward means let's go. Let, let, let's jump that four foot fence. Let's go. <laughs> you know, and I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> Sit back and breathe. And, and so that kind of tr- became my mantra all summer and then even starting school. When I catch myself worrying about things, I look at the picture of me sitting on, you know, Mr. Moon. And okay, sit back and breathe because I'm not in control. And if you remember that, but that was a very physical reminder. And, and, you know, I've tried to live by that. And sometimes I get manic and caught up and don't. But sit back and breathe because we're not doing it. What does it take for you to surrender control? I mean, that's what we're talking about here. What does it take? Sick and tired of being sick and tired. Okay, getting sick and tired of being sick and tired. What does it take to surrender control? Humility. Humility. Yeah, being humble. Our group is reading a book right now called Aha. Aha. Have an awakening, be honest about your situation, and then take action. Wow. Awakening to be honest about your situation and then take action. Yeah. That's exciting. It's exciting. I keep thinking about this is a really interesting conversation when you have somebody in the room who's, who's had everything. Uh-huh. Like everyone in life. And then lost it all. And then eventually got it all back again. And then lost it all again. And I do know a couple people like that. They seem to have a, a bigger picture. Huh. They've, they've been on both sides of that, huh? When it comes down to our faith, that's a matter of surrender. Do we believe that God has our lives in control? Now, that's different than us having control of our lives, yes? In fact, You can't have both those situations. You can't be in control of your life and let Christ be in charge of it. It doesn't work. Now, we try, don't we? How does that work out? It's amazing because what we do often in life is we say, God, I want you to do something, and then when it's not done the way we want, we try to take things back, and we do it our way, right? And it makes... Let's be honest. It makes a mess. And then we get frustrated and annoyed that we have a mess to clean up. And many of us, maybe not you, but many of us even then take it a step further and say, God, I can't believe you did this. And we throw it on God because he's the one in control. (laughs) How's it? I know it seems funny to many of us. But that's reality for many of us. And we often don't see it until, uh, until we have someone do that to us in life, where God may even use someone else to help us see what we're doing in our relationship with him. And it's amazing that, one, that he still loves us, and two, that he continues to let us in his family. He never kicks us out. As big of a mess as we may cause, he never kicks us out of the family. Yeah. That's the only really true thing in life in the world is salvation. That's true. The only free thing. And it wasn't free. And it's free We receive it, but it cost dearly. It cost dearly. It it cost us nothing. But it did cost Jesus his life. 
and we get to be in his family because of what he did. Now, so much of this, even in this passage, so much of this is not dependent on any work that we have. You mentioned take action. It's easy to take action out of salvation. But oftentimes, many of us want to put the action on the front side of salvation, don't we? We sometimes live our lives as though our salvation is dependent on what we do. Now, our action should come out of what we do, or what, what God has done. That is how that works. We are to show our faith, to share our faith, because of what he has done. But it is not a prerequisite. In fact, we can't do enough to earn it. But we must, as his family, our best action is to remain in perspective, remain in our hearts, humble as his family, to go and to do his work. God has a great family business going on. What is it? Making disciples, kingdom working. Yep. What, overall, though, what is, what are, why, why did he say, go and make disciples of all nations? Why does he, even as his kingdom, why does he do any of this? To save souls, that's very true. He created something. And it was lost in the fall. And he wants it back. So he's made a way to get it back. And we get to partner with him in doing that. Amen. We are the ambassadors of reconciliation. Amen. We get to go in his name to love and serve and to share his work of what he's done in our lives that others may experience this as well. And it's through being his family that we get to do this. Now, it's tough sometimes to be in certain families. I don't know if you grew up in that family or not. But sometimes there are families that... I was fifth in my family. I was the fifth, fifth boy. So when I got to school and encountered the teachers who had my brothers, there was this idea of they already knew me, right? They knew my mom. They knew my brothers. They knew how my brothers behaved. And they had already assigned me a certain set of expectations. Simply because of that. Is that fair? Probably not. Was it correct? Probably not. <laughs> There, there are times where, because of the family we're in, there are expectations laid upon us that may or may not be correct. What are some expectations that we have as the family of God? Because that's, what, that's the family we're in. That's the family that matters. Amen. And unbelievably, the world has expectations of the family of God. They have expectations of Christians. Are they all right? Indeed. It's so true, though, isn't it? And yet, as the family of God, who do we take? Where, do, where does our identity come from? Does it come from the expectations that the world has for us? Or does it come from who Christ is and have, following him as the head? That should be a pretty easy question to answer, I hope. But oftentimes, we don't live like it, do we? Yeah. There are, there are loads and loads and loads of stories. The, the, the most recent that I am aware of was when New Orleans was flooding. I think it was New Orleans. Maybe it, no, it was in somewhere in Texas. I think so. I think it was Houston. Um, and there was a huge outcry of how the church wasn't helping. And that rubbed me so raw. Because there were countless people running around with boats. How many of those do you suppose were the church? Now that does fly in the face of definitions of who the church is. And I think we do have to keep it as a who and not a what. Because when it becomes a what, there's an issue. 
But there's this idea of we have to live life as God's family, not taking our cues from what others say we should be. Not taking our actions out of what others say we should be doing. Who are we accountable to? As God's family, who are we accountable to? Yeah. So there are going to be times when we get to do things in this world that fly in the face of what this world says we should be doing. We see it in Scripture a lot. And that's as his family, as his children, we get to live as his children. Now, living as this royal family looks a little different than living as a earthly royal family, yes? But it doesn't change in perspective of we still get to go about the family business. Now, I know that title may, or that, that phrase may rub some of us a little funny, but God is in the business of reconciling the world to himself. That's why, that's, that's why Jesus had to die, that that's a possibility, that people can now come to faith in Jesus Christ and be saved. And that's what we get to share. As his family, we get the opportunity to go and to love and serve in his name to share the good news of Jesus Christ, that people can have faith and be saved. People get unsettled when you tell them that they have no control over life. I, I'd almost bet you that most people would grieve through that process. First, they're going to deny it. Then they're going to get very angry. And then the rest of what happens when you grieve something, that's all going to happen as you release control over life. But oh my goodness, it is so worth it. That's true, but we see it when Jesus tells the, the rich guy to give everything he has to the poor and come and follow me. Of like, ah, oh, I worked my whole life for this, and now, I, quote, now you want me to throw it all away? Because I'm almost certain many of us, if we're faced with that situation, would feel that very same way. You want me to do what? Who's in control of your life? Where are the areas that we're working in that we still sense, oh, God's asking me to release this over to him. And releasing things that God's asking us to release can be the best action we can ever take. It's tough. It's certainly not easy. But it can be so rewarding to step into doing what God has in store. Because I know oftentimes, especially in those times when we're wanting to take things back and start wrestling and make a mess, during those times we think we really know what we're doing. And yet if we're to trust God, to wait with him, to, to simply be responding to what he calls us to do, it's, it's possible and even likely that life is going to go well. Now, we, what well looks like is going to look different than what we expect or what we picture, right? Things are going to turn out differently. But it's going to go well. We may have to discern what our definition of well looks like and where it needs to change. Yeah. Sure. They think that they're going to lose it completely. Yeah, they think it's gone forever. Yeah, and that's what God does with us. Give me that thing and let me purify it and give you something better. Whereas earthly parents, we just want to launder that thing and get it coming in the back. But God will take that evil thing that we're hanging on to and then give us something so much better yeah. than what it was. And then when we start to understand that, we want to let go. Yeah. Until we 
Well, and, and many of you know that I like watching Forged in Fire. And in that show, they do all sorts of weird stuff of giving people barbed wire or ball bearings or any number of things to say, here, make something cool out of this. And as we deal with the sin in our lives, as we let God forge us and refine us, oftentimes the thing that causes us the most trouble and angst can be used as the best weapon when he refines and forms our lives to go about being his agents of, of reconciliation. Isn't that amazing? It's absolutely amazing. But it requires us to be responsive and be submissive to him in order for that to be done. And there's going to be an incredible amount of pressure that gets added and an incredible amount of, of refining that happens. But as we continue to stay there, as we stay within the arms of, of the craftsman, he's pretty good at what he does, okay? But as we stay there, he does remarkable things in the family. Our world has a huge push right now on diversity, yes? Have to have diversity, have to have diversity, have to have diversity. Does the family of God have diversity? Yeah. Even within communities like ours, there's diversity. Let alone when you start thinking about the globe. Oh, and to mention the, the cloud of, of saints. It's been around for, uh, uh, yeah, for a long time. It's unbelievable, but some of the things, that, some of the ways in which we worship God today did not even exist at other points in the world, at other points through history. So diversity is amazing. And yet we're told to what? What are we told to pursue? It's the only thing we're ever told to strive for in Scripture. Unity. unity. Can you get to unity by promoting diversity? That's separation. I, uh, yeah. It's, it even goes back to the isolation thing. When we continue to say, well, this is for this situation, this is for this, this is for this, and we continue to, to isolate due to diversity, we'll never achieve unity. But how cool is it when we do things as a family of God to do what is needed as the family of God in a unified body that when different things come up, the diversity actually builds on the unity. It's through the fact that we're unified going after what God wants us to do that the diversity makes possible the unity to bring about, oh, we can do this together. Your body is a perfect demonstration of this. Your fingers cannot do what your foot does. Your kidney has no chance of doing what your elbow does. But you are all one body. And the same is true of us as the body of Christ. We are all functioning very differently from one another. But if we ever, if we, if we only operate out of, well, this is what I do. I'm really good at this, and I'm not going to do anything else. I'm not going to be part of anything else. We don't have a shot at unity. If we focus on our diversity, we will never have a shot at, at unity. But if we bring about unity, it's through diversity that, that that happens. But we can't focus on it. I know it seems really weird, but that's why I believe God made us the way that he did, and we looking at our bodies is the best way of achieving this. To say, God, we as your family want to go about doing your work. Teach us how and help us to do it well. Yeah. Absolutely. So Sure. And I think even I, the, only, the only tweak I'd put to that is I think he wants us to focus on him. And through that focus, our needs will be provided. Because it's easy for me 
Maybe not for others, but it's easy for me that when I have a need and I focus on that, I'm missing loads and loads of other stuff. When I built Legos as a kid, I, I reached a point in my life in building Legos that when I would see a certain, a certain piece, that I'm like, I don't really have a plan for that yet, but I just, I'm learning that I, I learned that there were times that I needed to just grab it while I could find it because I was going to need it later. Now, I, that hasn't translated into a hoarding habit for me. <laughs> I suppose it could have. But there are times in our lives, I think, when we focus only on what we are looking for. We miss out on those extra things that God's pouring into our lives. We miss them. And God is inviting us to be his family and to be his family well. And we can't go about doing that by focusing on ourselves or by focusing on the problems of this world. As we share our lives in Christ, those problems will work out. God will lead us where he wants us to go and we'll take on, the, we'll take on everything the world has to throw at us and come out victors. Not because of anything we can do, but because of who we're doing it with. Isn't that amazing? That's the family we get to be a part of. That's the family we're in. So as we face our, as we, as we face our stuff in this world, may we know that God's got this. There's nothing, there's nothing, not one thing that can overcome our salvation. And that as we go about doing what God calls us to do, we can take, we can, we can bring strength. We can take courage in knowing that God's got this. We may not feel well. It may come off as, well, this is hard. This is difficult. Yeah, that may be. But when we do it as a family, there's no better purpose out there. Every problem becomes a testimony for the next family. Very true. Seek you first the kingdom of God, and God will have all these things. Indeed. I'd like to read Ephesians, or Ephesians 1 for us real quick as we close. So Ephesians 1, start in verse 11. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works everything out in conformity with his purpose, with the purpose of his will, in order that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. And you were also included in Christ that when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having believed, you were marked in him with the seal and promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession, to the praise of his glory. So may we know that God's got life worked out. There's nothing in this world that's going to overcome him. Now, it may try. In fact, it will. There will be battles. There will be, there will be scars. But we get the opportunity to love and, this, love and serve our Lord very, very well by being his family and growing in our faith. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that we get to be your family and that you let us in on doing what you do. Lord, we ask that you give us wisdom, that you bring about humility, that you increase our perception and our responsiveness to your call. Lord, give us hearts that want to follow you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go forth to love and serve him. Have a great day.